Welcome back from the breakouts. I hope you guys um, enjoyed those smaller gatherings. And we now have our final session of the day. I can't believe it. Um, I want to first introduce the moderator, Nancy Hill. Um, Nancy is president and CEO of the four A's. She has an extremely impressive resume. I was looking at all the places and agencies she's worked, from Donner in Baltimore to TBWA Chiat Day. She worked in St. Louis, Los Angeles, here in San Francisco at GMO and BBDO. And she also was profiled this week as one of the most powerful, 100 most powerful women in advertising and ad age. Um, but the thing I really want to tell you about Nancy is that she was one of the earliest supporters for this idea. And I still remember the phone call we had. It was probably about an hour long. And I think it was Cindy Gallup who connected us. And she's a woman who gets it like in the biggest way. And I just had an idea for this conference. And we just talked about my vision for it. And she gave me some money. I mean, I'll just put it out there. Um, and that little um, shot in the arm meant so much to me, because if, if she believed in this idea, then I had to make it happen. So I think Nancy is a very critical player to this event today, and I am eternally grateful to you. Um, thank you. Um, so Nancy's going to come up and introduce her amazing line of speakers. Um, and this is really the how-to part of our day, um, be the change you want to see. And I think we're all ready to hear that. So let's welcome Nancy. We are very, very well aware that we stand between you and a cocktail. So um, <laughs> we're going to do our best to make this a very open uh, conversation that hopefully gives you some things to think about and also some tangible things that you can take back to the agency. So I'm going to start by introducing our panelists briefly. Um, to my immediate left, we have Lauren Connolly, who is an executive creative director at what has been referred to several times today as a boys club, BBDO. <laughs> um, and I, I, asked, I asked Lauren what, one of the things she's most proud of in terms of the work that she's done. And I was very happy to hear her say M&Ms because I think we all have to admit that Miss Brown is pretty cool. That's been great work the last couple of months. Next to Lauren, we have Sam Johns, who is the founder and CEO of Amaridia. And she is most proud of the work that they've been doing for Comcast, which is also amazing work. And Sam has a story to tell about why she founded the agency that she's at right now. Actually, I'll correct that. She's not the CEO. She's the CCO. Um, next to uh, Sam, we have Jennifer Posner, who's the founder and executive director of Women in Media and the News. And she's also the author of Beauty Bites Back. And she was Reality. one that... Oh, Reality Bites Back. Reality Bites Back. Sorry, I wrote it down wrong. Uh, she's also one of the executive producers of the um, movie documentary that you saw the clip for this morning from Miss Re Representation. It, advisor. Advisor. Excuse me. Um, <laughs> and then at the very end, but certainly last but not least, we have Lauren Monroe Trice, who is the Director of Diversity and Inclusion at Ogilvy in New York. And she's also going to bring another perspective to the hiring part of this equation. So we're going to start with Jennifer because she brings an outside perspective to the way we're positioning ourselves as an industry to the world at large and to women in specific. And she's brought a couple of examples which I've asked her to very quickly go through to bring that outsider's perspective just to remind us that all this navel gazing that we do, this is what is that opinion from the outside looking in. So Jennifer. Thank you, Nancy. So, um, first of all, I want to thank Kat and give her some really amazing props for the fantastic conference that she's produced. And also, yes. And also, um, I want to thank her for inviting me. And I feel very honored and privileged to be with you as, I think, the only speaker from the journalism and media literacy worlds, as, as opposed to just inside the industry. Um, so today we've talked at great length about the need to increase women's voices and women in leadership in advertising um, and behind the scenes, of course. We've also talked about the persistence of bias, again, gender bias in hiring, in promotion, in day-to-day -day interpersonal reactions in the workplace. 
And I think that it's really important to take a step back and think about why are these biases so ingrained and 50 years after the second wave of the women's movement, why do they still uh, feel so persistent, right? Um, the good news is that as advertisers, you have so much power to change that paradigm because what you do influences culture in significant ways. It also influences culture very specifically to how you are perceived as businesswomen, right? So I think that um, we've heard a lot about behind the scenes. We haven't heard as much about content, and that, as a media critic, is what I can bring here, and I hope that it's useful to you. So let's take a look at um, an ad campaign by Westin Hotels, which was aimed at female business travelers. Can you play the print, show the print ad? So this was an ad campaign. There were several ads in it, but the tagline was she, and it was by Weston. She uh, plans the annual meeting. She plans on it being a smashing success. She plans on getting a huge promotion. Who is she sleeping with? And that was, that was the tagline for all of their campaigns for that period of time. Who is she sleeping with? So it gives us the idea, still to this day, that women are less competent in the workplace. Women are not able to achieve unless they're you know, giving some favors on the side. They're not making the tough calls in business. They're just making the booty calls. And of course, we know that's not the reality. But this is the kind of campaign that contributes in subtle ways to the persistence of those biases that we heard data about this morning. So then, I also want to say it doesn't have to be that way, right? We all know that there are other ways to tell stories. And uh, I think it's a little telling. I tried to find a really positive print ad of women in business, could not find one, asked a lot of fellow media literacy folks and ad monitors, they couldn't find one either. So instead, I'm, um, I found a TV commercial that I think totally changes the paradigm and shows what women and girls can achieve if only they're given a few basic tools and some mentoring to make it happen. Can you play the commercial? Hey, Susie, why don't you use this? Ah! Oh, no. Okay. Um, can you? We need video. We need the video. Not just the audio. Okay, so while they're while they're finding that actual video, um, does anybody remember the Verizon Susie's Lemonade Stands TV commercial? So uh, you can fill in the blanks. It's basically little girl has a lemonade stand. Dad comes by, gives her a Verizon phone. Hey, Susie, use this. It has a calculator. She says, great. Immediately things take off. She's calculating the amount of lemonade, and, and she's making huge profits, and now she's in a business suit, and she has adults trailing her, and she's the head of a big Susie's Lemonade company, and everything's amazing. And in 30 seconds, we've totally re reconstructed what we think of little girls, what we think of their capabilities, and what we think of women in business, right? So there are a lot of ways we can go, and it's all about thinking every time you make an ad, what are the ideas we're normalizing, and what are the ideas we're reinforcing? What is the premise resting on? Um, so in planning this conversation today, um, one I don't remember who, but one of us said something about um, what does content what does the work look like if it's made in a, in a female voice or in a feminine voice? And what I said was, to me, it's not about making work with a female voice, because we all know women are not a monolithic group, right? Women are diverse in terms of race and age and sexual orientation and economic status and life experience. So, you know, saying women doesn't mean much, but it also takes men out of the equation, right? Instead, I like to say, and I would love to encourage you, to think about work that respects women and girls. And that means that anybody can do it, no matter the, regardless of the gender of the person or the team creating the work, regardless of the target audience of the work. Work that um, respects women and girls, um, the content is powerful because it, a, I'm going to give you a couple of bullet points of what it doesn't do and a couple of bullet points about what it does. Um, work that respects women and girls doesn't glamorize violence against them doesn't rely on gratuitous, <laughs> cliched, hypersexualized images that are so played out and tired, the kinds that you saw in the trailer for misrepresentation, doesn't assume that all women are white, <laughs> um, reflects and respects ethnic diversity, 
um, doesn't treat women as inherently dumber or less competent than men, and doesn't reinforce or rest on the notion that the proper place for women is in the kitchen, the bedroom, or the nursery. Instead, content that respects women and treats them as nuanced people with power and agency over their lives, um, depending on the context, has any of the shows women having any of these following uh, criteria. Humor, intelligence, style, charisma, talent, skill, strength, ingenuity, creativity, and so on. These are the kinds of things we should be going for. So of course women don't have to be. When I say we want positive, respectful images of women, I don't mean that women should always be portrayed as strong or always be portrayed as perfect. Perfection is also an impossible ideal, right? I just mean that we need to move away from the, um, see that 32-year-old with five strands of gray hair? Convince her she needs to dye them or she'll die alone. We need to move away from that and toward more Susie's Lemonade stands and less who is she sleeping with. So thank you. Oh, I'm sorry, I had one last thing to say which just says that um, the reason that I bring up content today is we've talked so much about women, uh, encouraging women to uh, hire, retain, mentor other women and encouraging the 97% of male creative directors to do the same thing. Um, I think that one of the best ways to do that, women will flock to your company, women will want to work for you if you are the agency, if you're the team that creates Susie's Lemonade Stand and not Teleflora. Thank you, Jennifer. <laughs> We'll get back to the Teleflora ad in just a second. Um, I, I think that was a really great jumping off point for discussing um, agencies, three very different agencies who've been very successful at bringing women into the creative department, nurturing them, and growing them to either creative directors or executive creative directors. And I actually want to start with one, the first one with Ogilvy. Ogilvy has a really long history of not only women leading the creative department, but women leading the agency. It's something that's part of their culture, it's part of their DNA. And one of the things that Lauren and I have talked a lot about is what that has done for the way that they look at bringing new people into the agency and the way they look at how that reflects on their culture and certainly in the work. Totally. And I think it's perfect because um, we didn't create, obviously, the Susie's Lemonators. I would have showed that. But we did create the Dove Real Beauty campaign. <coughs> and I think everyone, that's right, congratulations. <laughs> um, and it's lovely because it was in the misrepresentation films that made me really happy. But one of the things that was so positive about it, and this is sort of to Nancy's point, is we've always had a tradition, or I shouldn't say always, but in more recent years, have had a tradition of senior women across the agency in leadership roles. So in the creative department, in the typically male-dominated roles, and then even at the top. So I think many people are familiar with Shelley Lazarus, but we, she's not actually the first female CEO, which many people don't recognize with Ogilvy. But one of the things that I, I find interesting is Dove Evolution, most people are aware of, and that's more about the Photoshopping and all that type of stuff, but are most of you, and just by a raise, a raise of hands, um, are you familiar with Onslaught? Very, very few, and, and obviously my colleague from Ogilvy can't raise her hand. But <laughs> what is interesting to me about that is I actually thought Onslaught <laughs> was a much more powerful video, and it's something we showed and talked about internally, and we brought it on campus. So when we, d when we went out and recruited for everyone, because we, at diversity we look at it for uh, making sure we're championing everyone, not just particular genders or ethnicities, but we talked about Onslaught because it was more about the, little, the younger girls. And it was actually very similar to sort of what they talked about in misrepresentation, so I highly recommend you check it out. Um, and it focused on just the onslaught of information and negative reinforcement that women see, especially children from all ages, um, in the media. And it's really great, so just go check it out. But my point about this is it helped us not only become an agency that was won awards, which is very clearly important for all of us, but it allowed and made recruiting so much easier. We mm. didn't have to say anything. We could go on campus, people knew Ogilvy, but they said, you're the ones who created Dove. I, wanna, I came to this presentation, I am recruiting or want to be part of your agency because you're creating information that's new, it's fresh, it talks to women, and it's not just about our bodies, but it's about our self-image and how do we have that conversation with our children. So we're very proud of that. Um, I don't know how much more you want yeah, to Yeah, no, and, and you know that perfectly dovetails <coughs> with what Courtney talked about earlier, that now he's worried that YNR here in San Francisco has a, an 80% uh, female creative department and he's going to lose out on the competition because yeah. they're going to want to go work there. We all need to be able to differentiate ourselves and if that's the way you can do it, then you should embrace it and take it on. But, you know, having, full disclosure, having worked at BBDO, 
um, and watching it um, up close and personal. <laughs> now, I will admit, I'm not a creative um, and never was a creative, but I do hope that I was a creative person, a <laughs> good account person. Um, but I do know that it's not always been easy in that creative department. And uh, Lauren has really done very well there. But they've also made a lot of changes, I think, in that creative department to make it more female friendly. And surprise, surprise, it's working. So would you talk a little bit about that? Sure. I think the topic of this, be the change you want to see. And when I thought about that, I thought, what does that look, what did that look like for me? And it was the moment about six years ago, maybe seven, when they came to me and they said, oh, great news, you're running this female Razor account now. And I thought, well, why? And they said, well, you're the only female creative director we have left. And, no, wow. and I thought, OK, well, great. If we're using that logic, then I watched 15 NFL games this weekend, and I only shaved my legs once. So I guess I'm running the NFL <laughs> also. Um, and I thought, well, what's wrong with thinking that way? And, and how is that not in line with the agency's point of view? And the agency really had one goal and one mission. It's about the work, the work, the work. And thinking like that, is, is a shortcut. It's what Cindy talked this morning about going into default mode. And we don't do that at BBDO. We don't do that creatively. So why would we do that with where the female creative directors are? So it was really looking at how we put that focus on the work into everything that we do in the agency. And really, um, we started something called the Diversity Council, which a lot of agencies mm -hmm. have. But the important thing is it was management created the diversity council. Management sits on the diversity council. It looks less like a 20-something Benetton ad and more like the EVPs, the people who could really affect the change. So that was something that really started to shape the way we are now. Well, that's you know certainly one of the things that um, we have learned in all of our efforts for inclusion uh, across the industry. If it does not come from the very top, mm -hmm. And I mean the CEO, and if it's a worldwide CEO, it has to be the worldwide CEO. If it does not come from the top, it doesn't happen. Because people don't understand that it's a mandate for the mm -hmm. agency, and that it's a good business uh, principle for the agency, and that it makes a difference. But Sam, one of the things that we talked about a little bit earlier is that you decided that you wanted to just go off and do your own thing. So you started your own agency. You are the chief creative officer. And I think that also sets a completely different culture for the creatives in your creative department. Absolutely. Um, I have just a little story to tell you that when I was in first grade, I actually wanted to go into theater. They were putting up this great show on Cinderella. And I was like, you know what? I'm going to go for Cinderella. I was outspoken when I was young. I could act, I had you know all the, the moves figured out, and when I auditioned, I didn't get the part. So a beautiful, blonde, white girl got the part, and I was given the part of the stepsister. And so I figured very quickly that <laughs> this is not going to work in, in the larger picture. And going into creative, where I could be creative and work creatively without you know, my face mattering or my gender mattering, all of those things, it was really about the work. And moving forward, um, I moved to Europe where I had great digital experience and coming back to the US, I decided, you know, it's really difficult for me to break back into the market here. So why don't I start my own firm and give other women or other people of diverse backgrounds a chance to kind of flourish without having to worry about who they are, where they came from, and really focus on the work. And that was, that was the, the principle that we founded at Meridian. So I'm hearing a recurring theme here, which is, it, and it, this is BBDO's mantra, but it is, it's all about the work. And I think that too many people, too many times, feel like, and especially women, they don't have a voice in not only coming up with the ideas, but in the nurturing of the work and taking that idea and doing something else with it. And I, I think that it's very important that we talk a little bit about when you speak up, and you raise your hand, and you, you say those things that nobody else wants to hear, and you ask the tough questions that everybody's been talking about, what happens? What happens at um, your shop, Sam, for instance? Well, in any, any situation, you're taking a risk when you, when you speak up. So in our shop, what we do is we have an open door policy, not only to my room, 
but I walk into their space. So there, there are people who really, <coughs> women, maybe they're Asian or they're of a, of a different background where they don't feel comfortable to stand up and speak in a big room full of men and women. They would rather have a one-on-one -on -one conversation. So it's really about them understanding that they're not at risk when they speak up and providing a safe place for them to speak up. So, so it doesn't have to be behind closed doors in my office, but I would actually take them aside in an informal setting, kind of gauge what's going on, or, or understand their body language, or understand really, you know, this person could do more. Like, why aren't they standing up and, and saying this? Or I see their sketchbook has these great things in it, and why aren't they presenting these ideas? So it's kind of understanding their perspective as an individual and trying to pull that out a little bit more. Yeah, I've heard a lot of people talk the last couple of days about creating a safe environment. And Lauren, I, I, you know, you and I both worked with the same creative department. You've been there 13 years, so we experienced the same people. That was not always a safe environment. Um, so where did you get the courage to ask those tough questions and raise your hand for those tough assignments and, and say, you know, this is something I want to take on? To give myself all the credit, it's just my <laughs> personality. I, no, I had, a, I had a mentor. I had Susan Cradle, who um, was fearless, and she knocked down all those doors and she fought the tough fights and she you know battled and she paved the way so that so that I could see what was possible the other thing is what I learned from that is asking the tough questions when when you have part of the solution or you have an alternative idea versus just asking a tough question and I think when you start to do that when you start to see those moments of I've thought this through, and I have an action step. You can really affect change that way. I think that's a really good thing to keep in mind because you know they always tell lawyers, don't ask a question you don't know the answer to because <coughs> you could get yourself caught short in court. And if you ask the tough questions in an agency and you don't have a, an alternative solution, then everybody's going to say, OK, so what's your suggestion? And you're left sort of standing there not really realizing that you, you just asked a tough question that's not going to go anywhere because you didn't offer a solution. Um, I'd be really curious to talk a little bit more about mentoring because I, I, I watched you and Susan and, and I know that to be true. But Lauren at Ogilvy, the Lauren that doesn't have the you in her name, um, talk a little bit about the mentoring programs that you have in place. Because I know some of them are formal and some of them yeah. are informal, but they're equally important. So, and it's interesting, um, cause the, so I started my career in New York, so I'm gonna talk mostly from a New York perspective, but we, I'm, I'm here in San Francisco. So the mentoring program is much larger in New York, and we sort of have had that question of, is it formal, is it informal? I kind of come from the school of informal, mentoring works a little bit better, and mostly because you sort of, uh, you're out in an event, you're in a meeting, you meet someone, you have that personality click, and you're much more willing to sort of spend some time with that person and be a lot more open. <coughs> and, and I think most people are familiar with the mentor versus the sponsor, right? The mentor, you're gonna tell all the good and all the bad and really like strive for advice, and then the sponsor, you tell only the good because mm. they're the ones behind the closed doors really fighting for you. And so we've tried to be really clear about the distinctions between both, but also who's invited, quote unquote, to the mentor programs. Because usually when it's formalized, and that's something that we found out, it's people who already know people who already know other people who still know the same people, and they would have been promoted anyway. So we, when um, uh, the chief diversity officer and myself joined the agency, we really wanted to look at who's part of the mentoring program from the mentor level and the mentee level. And if you're not familiar with the mentor program, then talk to us and we, the two of us, will take that responsibility to make sure you can find a mentor. So that's been the official program. Informally, we have also a diversity council, which we like to be kind of the voice of those who don't have a voice or don't feel their voices heard. And from that, we created our employee resource groups, which are called our professional networks. And we have nine of them, and they're, they're women's leadership is one. And so we create a forum and an environment where people can meet other people to say, hey, I think you might be someone I want to talk to. And my one big advice about mentorship is, if you're not sure if someone's your mentor, ask them. You know, I really want you to be my mentor. Because a lot of times people are like, I don't know, I go to this person, or I think this person's my sponsor. Ask them. Because if they're really going to be your mentor, your sponsor, if it, informally or formally, they're going to let you know. And it's also a mutually beneficial piece. So I do say, if you don't feel that there's a formal program in your agency or in your company, just find a person that you click with. And it doesn't always have to be, we talked about, male. I mean, a female. Sometimes it's a male. It's someone whose ideals you emulate. I think um, Condi Rice said that in the misrepresentation. Mm -hmm. And I loved that. Because 
we're not always there at the top, but find people who are similar to you and will help you grow. Sir Jennifer. Um, so uh, there's a really interesting corollary in the world of journalism and, uh, and entertainment media to the 3% of women who are ad creative directors. Women only have 3% of clout titles in Fortune 500 media and telecom companies. So this is work that I've been doing in that realm for a very long time. And so I like to think of mentoring. I never had a mentor, but even when I was, we were talking about this a little earlier, even when I was 24, I was mentoring high school girls because I've always felt like it was really important to bring people along. But now I think of mentoring in a broader way. I think about mentoring in the field. So one of the things that we did uh, when I founded Women in Media and News was I created a project called the Power Sources Project, which stands for Perspectives of Women Expand Reporting, which is a solution to the constant underrepresentation of women as news sources in all subjects. So we have this national database of women who are experts in economics and medicine and science and international trade and advertising and et cetera. And whenever a journalist or a media producer is looking for somebody to speak, they don't need to call just to say, we want the women's perspective. We just want an expert who's really qualified and savvy. And then I send them a woman, and it's a win-win for me. Um, and it's also a win-win for them, because they have good people. Um, another, and I think that you can do that in your industry, in your individual silos too. Keep lists of the people who you think need to be mentored or need to be on that panel or, need, or who should be nominated for the jury prize um, and suggest them. The other thing is on a personal level, as well as the executive director, as a statement that I've made, a sort of a promise I've made as the executive director of this nonprofit, I never speak on panels or at conferences that are all white or mostly white. So for example, when Kat asked me to speak here, I said, who else are your other speakers? And are there women of color speaking? And she, she was saying, well, maybe, and, and we're going to try. And I was like, well, if you try and succeed, then, then you get me. Um, and if not, I can help you. I can suggest other people. And she was really great about it. Um, but that's another thing. You know, don't, be, don't settle for being the token woman. Bring other women along and bring people of color along. So that brings me to another subject that's sort of near and dear to my heart. Um, how many of you have <coughs> seen or heard about the open letter that I wrote to women in advertising asking them to speak up? Can you give me a mm. show of hands? Um, I, I encourage you to read it. It's on our website. Um, it was in response to some programming that we were doing for a conference that we had last week that was targeted at creative technologists. And uh, some people who are my friends were calling us out because the initial program that went out was largely male. But guess what? Not because we weren't trying to get females, it's because they were the first ones to say yes. And we were still waiting for confirmation for all the women to say that they were going to be there. Meanwhile, we had several women cancel. And the letter I wrote was about asking a lot of questions as to why this is happening. But it brings me back to the, the, somebody mentioning that women become ghosts mm -hmm. and they don't promote themselves and they don't create their own brand. And when you think about creatives and when you think <coughs> about people in creative departments who you're going to hire, who you're looking to bring on board, you, you t don't tend to think of the women first because the men have done a better job of promoting themselves, promoting their careers, promoting their brands. So Lauren, I'm going to put you on the spot. Yes. Talk a little bit about how that thought has entered your mindset over the thinking about this conference. I would say, and it sort of builds on what we just talked about, in that I admit there are a lot of things when it comes to that that I am really bad at. But there are a lot of people who are really good at it. And creating a board of directors for me personally, who is good at promoting themselves? Who is good at negotiating contracts? Who is good at scheduling and time management? And, <coughs> and making sure when you commit to a conference, you don't bail at the last minute. So having those people in place and and saying they're real men, women, whomever they are, they're really good at that skill set, and I'm going to learn from them. I think that's really important. The other thing about speaking up is that it, you have to have a, we talked about a, a, a safe place for it, and, and people who are receptive to that. And without that, it's, it's extremely difficult. I agree, I agree. Um, but I also think that it takes, again, from the top, people encouraging you to go do that. So that there's not this feeling of, if I leave to go to this conference, I'm missing out on a couple of days in the middle of a really big project. 
There's no excuse for that these days because we have the technology in place that mm -hmm. allows that to happen. So what would, you, what would you all say to women about making sure that they're getting themselves out there as much as the men are? Talk a little bit about that from your perspective, Lauren. It's an interesting thing, and we talked a little bit about this before, um, about sort of speaking up and how relevant and important that is. And I, I think that just from an HR perspective, and I come from a different background, so I come from finance <laughs> first, and then I came to, to this uh, lovely world of advertising. And I had that, I was very naive, and I, I hate to admit that, but when you come from a very male-dominated group of bankers and sales and traders, and then you have this philosophy in your head that I'm going to advertising and it's so much more diverse and it's so much more accepted. And I was like smacked in the face so quickly the first day that I walked in. So what we found was we there were physically people in the room, but they weren't talking, they weren't speaking up. And Sam, you talked a little bit about this earlier at, at lunch, but everybody speaks differently and extroverts and introverts, uh, it's cultural, there's so many different ways to speak up. So people have to not treat the way you want to be treated, but treat people the way they want to be treated. Mm -hmm. And you have to talk to your managers, and you have to have your senior leaders understand that. And if they don't understand, ask the question. And if they don't want to ask the question, then have someone there who is that leader and who can speak for you. And so that's something that we've really, really, really tried to do, because don't assume someone else is going to speak for you. Don't assume someone else is going to be in your corner. You know, I think it's relevant, right? Be the change that you want to be. And if you can't find that person, and, and I should probably soon say, then you better leave your agency because something's going on. Mm -hmm. And it has to be in your culture, and it has to be ingrained in your culture. I think also enlist the people around you in your goal, in that goal. Um, I work, my partner's a man, he's wonderful, and I couldn't be here if he wasn't back at the agency getting ready for a pitch tomorrow. So I've communicated <coughs> with him what's important in my career and what's important to me within the industry. So we're all together yeah. in, in making sure that we have each other's backs and the people we work with can get our backs when we're out doing something or promoting something or, or talking about the important issues is very important. So a support group that, that knows why it's important and will help you. That's a really good point, actually, and it's something that we've done, and I, I'm not going to sit here and just, I love my CEO, he's really awesome, but we've, we've asked him, because there have been certain meetings and things we've had to do where individuals who we've asked to take leadership roles will have to be out of the office for a significant amount of time, and it's something where the CEO has held the meeting, so he will say, listen, I'll CC him, or you can tell him to be your voice as well, but you do have to ask the question, and I think it's a really good point, you have to find someone who has your back, because at the end of the day, the work does have to get done. That's absolutely true. I, I Go agree, ahead, Sam. and I also think that um, we're so involved as creative directors in doing the work. We, we're busy, we, we just want to do the work, we want to do a good job, we, we want to create a good culture in our agency, um, that we forget that how important something like this conference is. Mm -hmm. That, you know, it's, it's putting a stamp to something that everyone has been talking about. So it's really supporting conferences like this or supporting greater ideas and like, you know, maybe it's a letter to, you know, the editor or maybe it's a way to, to really speak up more and stand beyond your work. Yeah, I think, I think women having a voice in the industry that is bigger than just having a voice inside of their own agencies is critical mm -hmm. to our success in making this movement work. Because if we don't stand up for ourselves in the industry at large, then we're not gonna have a voice inside the agency. That's why the boys have had it, mm -hmm. because they got famous. And they got famous because they promoted themselves. And if we don't do the same thing for ourselves, we're never gonna have that equal voice or that equal seat at the table. That's, that's exactly what I wanted to, to sort of dovetail off of, which is that um, when, uh, when I do media trainings for women's organizations and for women in various industries, whether it's women who help girls get out of sex trafficked situations or whether it's women who are high up in financial corporations, um, when I go around the room and I ask in the very beginning, are you an expert? At least half of the women in the room say no. And these are all women who are, you know, badasses in their fields and know at least as as much, if not twice as much, as their male colleagues, and yet they generally don't own their expertise because we're socialized as women not to, and then we have these images in media that tell us that we don't um, have the competence that men have. And so one of the key, key things about speaking up, whether it's in, inside an agency or whether it's doing that interview with 
your local press or the national press, et cetera, is just own it. Know that you are qualified to speak to your expertise right now. Don't say, you know, Bob is a little more uh, qualified in this particular thing. Call me next time when you're in this very specific. No, just say yes. Just speak up, just own it. And, um, and part of it is building a brand too so that you can be known and famous outside of your company. And that can be anything from Twitter to talking to, uh, at the New York Times, right? Um, but you are qualified to do it and you have the right to do it. And all that data in the morning about women are bitches, if they, forget about it. Because it's, it's true, but it's also true that you are valuable and your experience and your perspective is valuable and nobody's gonna make that happen unless you do. I, I think one of the things we try to do is very tactical, but maybe you could take away is the Diversity Council tries to be <coughs> three weeks a month ahead of that request. So <coughs> there is a gatekeeper at the agency, so when that comes into the agency, he's gonna turn and say, okay, who's available to do this? So the Diversity Council is really, we're focused at going three weeks ahead. So um, Advertising Women of New York's coming up. Who are we nominating? So we go to the PR person and say, this is, what we this is the person we think we should put forward versus letting people in, in their jobs kind of react when the request comes. So not letting what Cindy called the default mode kick in, but really being proactive and putting people forward and volunteering for those. When, the agent, when somebody comes and says, who wants to judge the, the Clio's? we're hopefully already saying, all right, who should we put forward to judge the Clio's? And if I could just piggyback yeah. off that, we, we're very similar. We talked earlier, because we both had the diversity councils, and it's been really helpful, because I think, I agree with you, Jennifer, that you do have to speak up for yourself, but I also think you need someone else to help recognize yeah. that as well, and, and this is to your question earlier about, when you looked at that list, certain <coughs> names rung out, and so something we've tried to do, I mean, we all know that March is Women's History Month, right? But we're not just women in March, so how do we make sure that we are promoting internally as well, so the na so names are recognizable. And one of the things that we've done was our Women's Leadership Council um, from New York is they've, they, every month they find a list and they talk to the other networks, they make sure it's, a peop it's women of color, women across all disciplines from administrative to PR to creative, and they highlight a different woman on their Facebook page every uh -huh. single week so that it's just constantly going around and people say, oh, I know that name, I saw them, and I know a little bit about them. But we have to do that a little bit more at our agencies. Yeah, I, I think that it's been interesting in my 30 years in the business um, that <laughs> women just now are starting to realize that they have to promote themselves, which does not come naturally. Totally. Um, we, we are taught to live under that axiom of it, um, it really doesn't matter uh, if it's a success, who gets the credit? And we are more than willing to stand back and basically mm -hmm. say, I don't need the credit because mm -hmm. it's a success. And, that, and I think <coughs> we have to stop doing that to ourselves because it's to our detriment. Yeah, we don't even ask the women. We just put them out there. Yeah, and that's, <laughs> you know what? It, get them out of their comfort zone because that's the way it's got to be. And I love that it's not only in March. I love it. <laughs> so I, I, I want to end this before I turn it over to questions with, with what I asked you not to reveal to me but to, um, to spontaneously answer the question, what's the one thing you're gonna take away from today that you're gonna take back either for yourself or for your agency or for the industry that you're gonna immediately implement? So I'll just start on that end and come this way. I Sorry, like, Lauren. With me. <laughs> so I th the sad part is we thought about this. This is a very difficult question. Um, mine's gonna be a little bit superficial, but I think it's, it's something that I realized actually yesterday when I was talking to my fantastic creative women in the San Francisco office is something that I personally do and I, I say is this whole focusing on how women don't support women, it's such a fact, but we are continually talking about it and talking about it. So I, I, for me, I wanna take away and sort of say, one, I'm gonna change my vocabulary. I'm gonna stop saying the word catty. I'm gonna mm -hmm. stop calling women bitchy because I do it all the time, and I recognize that that's something that I need to stop, because if I'm asking <coughs> other women not to do that and to support each other, I need to change how I'm utilizing those words. Even though I only do it in company around women, it's still not a good thing. Yeah, but you know what? It's really easy to slip, and if we do it, we give men permission to do it. And that's exactly and right. And that's the wrong message to send to them. Jennifer. Well, since I'm not from the industry, I feel like I would just love to suggest a couple of takeaways since I don't have an agency to take something back to. Um, and my takeaway, is, my suggestion is that 
Um, everything we've talked about today is so powerful, and it can either be implemented into action or it can just be stuff we've heard today, right? So my suggestion is think of at least one to two things that you're going to try and implement when you get back to your agency. So is that suggesting, for example, I've, I've seen certain news media companies have success in, um, in diversifying their newsrooms by tying newsroom diversity to high-level executive pay bonuses. Um, some, sometimes it's about quotas, other times people are really scared of the word quota. Okay, I'm not suggesting one way or another, it's just a thing to think about. But the main thing that I want you to do is think, for those who are in the creative side, um, think about whenever you're from the developmental stage to the pitching to the you know, art direction to the ad copy, think about what are the messages that this ad are, what are those messages reinforcing? Who are the people that are gonna feel empowered by this ad and who are the people who might feel devalued from it? Why are we create, why are we going with certain images over other images? Just to be a little more conscious about the underlying messaging because sometimes in the rush to get it done, those things take a back seat and we need to put them forward to make change. Thank you. Sam. Okay, so I feel that I am the change I've wanted to see. <laughs> All right. Um, but it's, um, it's, it's been really tough, but we've accomplished it. We've created a great culture at our agency and 80% of them are women, not because we haven't tried to recruit men, <laughs> but just because of the culture that we've tried to create and they've been the best people for the job. Um, what I would really recommend to anybody in this audience who has a decision making in hiring, I would say really look closely at your recruiting process and your, you know, from the job description to up to like who are you interviewing and are you actually seeking out people that normally you wouldn't look for. So I, I would, that would be my recommendation. That's a great recommendation. Mm -hmm. Lauren. The thing I'm going to implement is that I thought I had an amazing mentor in Susan Cradle. And I realized that she had a really good succession plan in me. Mm -hmm. And what she did was take me and promote me to do her job so that she could move up. And I think that's what I want to go back to the agency and do is find the people who can take my job mm -hmm. so that I can that's great. go elsewhere. Mm -hmm. All right. We left some time for questions, and um, I know, again, cocktails are standing on the other side of this. So let's um, see, who has a question? OK, Bueller. <laughs> <laughs> I can't stop. I'm a big mic hog, sorry. Um, <laughs> I just wanted to, um, this is more of a comment and a little bit of a shout out to the younger women in the audience. Um, one of the things that strikes me, in the, especially in the past few hours, is that a lot of us who have been in the industry for a long time are talking a lot about, you know, your, your experience speaks to your talent and your talent um, and your track record speak for itself and, you know, celebrate that and promote yourself. Um, but I think it's also important to just mention to the young women here, especially the ones that have uh, helped Kat put this conference together, that um, the way to get ahead when you're breaking in is to be your authentic self you don't have a track record when you first set foot in the door, but the thing that you do have is you, and the closer you are to you and the more passionate you are about yourself and promoting the things that make you who you are, um, that's what makes you interesting to people who hire you. And then also I will say one other thing, I will shout out to one of my mentors who is Alain Cote, so I'm very lucky. I am, uh, an, uh, a, uh, she called me a creative person in literally account clothing when I first started. <laughs> Um, but one of the most important things you can do is find out in the agency environment cross-functionally what your um, compadres need. Um, I was an account, but I learned very quickly to be successful, you needed to find out what your creatives need. And that's vice versa. What your account people need is what you should learn as a creative. So that's, that was just more of a comment. I want to touch on one thing that you said because it was a big aha moment for me. And that I, I've been in this industry 15 years, been at BBDO 13. The women starting there have a very different take on the world. Mm -hmm. they, they, they don't have the baggage that I have. And I think it's really important to check in on that from time to time and not bring in those mentoring relationships 
things that they may not even be experiencing because of all the work that everyone in the room has done to get us to where we are. So continually to look at it where the women entering the, the agency are like, what are you talking about? Yeah, that's very what true. What do you mean I'm not going to run this place in a few years? Like, <laughs> uh -uh. Does Andrew know that? <laughs> I, I think that's a very valid point because I, I do think, especially for some of us who have been at it for a really long time, uh, we do bring some baggage to it, and I think that's a really good point in a, to remind ourselves that their perspective is very different from mm -hmm. ours. Uh, and yet there are still some things that have to be worked out. Do we have other questions? Yeah, we have one back there. Wait, we can't hear you yet. <coughs> Hello? There you go. Hi, I'm Nancy Hannon from the Martin Agency. I'm a group creative director. And I love that we're talking about action items and what we can do coming out of this conference. And, I, and we talked a little bit about talking to our clients. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering, there seems to be a lot of, a lot more women sort of at the big table these days. There's a lot of, coming out of our, uh, the recession, there's a lot of, it just seems to be more CEOs, COOs, CMOs, or, or at least we're hearing about that. And I'm wondering if, if anybody has thought about some of our client partners here, if they, or even misrepresentation, going to these clients, these female clients who are amazing and are kicking ass, and, and talking to them about this ch instituting this change so that it comes from the clients and we can then all work to move women forward. I, I think that's a really good suggest a suggestion. I think that's certainly something that we can all do on an individual agency basis because <coughs> they, we know who those clients are. But it's also something that we, the 4As, has been talking to the ANA about and raising this issue. It's not always an easy conversation, um, not always open to that conversation because they have other things to do. But it is something that's very much on my radar screen on a daily basis, and I, I know I have a responsibility to bring that forth on behalf of the industry. So note taken, um, push that as fast and hard as I can. And I think, again, we have to do it at an agency level with the individual clients that we work with every day. We've actually been doing it to, to, from more on a, um, uh, an overall diversity perspective with our IBM client. We actually, since I think about the second year that I joined, we have a, a quarterly meeting and it's the account team, the creatives, and it's myself and the chief diversity officer to talk not just about the marketing to make sure it has the right messaging, um, but also about our staffing and who's in the room and who's involved. And we're, we're starting to put it in more of our RSV, um, uh, RFPs with our, <coughs> our new clients as well. Yeah, I, I think it's really important that we get past those days of, oh, we need to have a woman in the room. So, oh, you. Yeah, um, stop with the that token. Happens, it still happens way too many times. I know there was another one. Um, I just want to make, I suppose, just a comment, and that is we've talked a lot about mentoring um, today, and it typically is talking about you know, mentoring younger women in the business. But I have been strenuously mentored by other peers, um, people who are at my same level, mm -hmm. who have helped me out, um, given me decks to be able to copy so I could get some other things done. So I don't, I would, don't underestimate the power of your peers to help you and be honest with you about some of those things because sometimes they know more than you do about a lot of things. So take advantage of that. Yeah, I know from my own perspective, I spent <coughs> um, 20 of my years in this business not working in New York. And when I got to New York, I felt like I had landed on another planet because it, I didn't know anybody. I didn't have my career, I didn't have my network, I didn't know anybody. Uh, I, I should take that back. I, I knew a few other exiles from San Francisco, um, <laughs> and they were very few. But there were many people in the industry who graciously, many women, who graciously reached out to me and said, let me help you. And that made all the difference at BBDO, at Lowe, and certainly in this job at the 4As, because I was not of Madison Avenue, which was a boys club, and I needed those women to reach out to me. So when you see a woman who you think you can help, it's also okay to pick up the phone and say, hey, I'm here if you need me. And I think we just don't do enough of that. It's a really, really important thing. Do we have any other questions? Where are we going? Oh. Oh, just uh, I don't know where yeah. the microphone went. <laughs> um, <laughs> and I'll yeah. try and repeat yeah, it. Yeah, we can hear you. So right now, I have a lot of, I just got out of ad school like three or four years ago, and when I got out, we were all like super passionate and driven. And now I'm having more and more of my friends drop out of advertising. Not just out of their, you know, place of work or agency, but out of advertising altogether. And it's for the reason you wouldn't be here and you wouldn't have Choices or because other fields seem more viable because of the lifestyle they want to live, everything 
Go ahead, Sam. <laughs> <It's, laughs> like, I have some thoughts. Yeah, we'll, yeah. <laughs> well, well, we've seen that happen at our agency where people drop yeah. out and they, they're actually moving into the like Google, Amazon.com. Mm. You know, they love the technology field and they feel that that's where they're growing. But if you if you want if you want to advise your friends or like understand why they have to have passion for the business. Yeah, agreed. So if they don't have that passion, then that's not really their thing. And and I don't think it's any other barrier other than really loving what you're doing. I'm so glad you said that because that was my thought, and I was like, is that negative? Yeah. <laughs> but it, I mean, and especially when you compared it to your own point of view and how much you love it, and it just is every like it, it oozes from your pores. If you're in the wrong industry, if you don't feel that way. If you don't want to have that confidence and the patience to just really get through it and make a, a, a new place for yourself, I don't think Sorry, you can, I, yeah. I, like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't agree. I, I'm sorry, I don't agree with you. I love advertising, but if somebody said to me, hey, you can make money like watching TV or writing a book that you've always wanted to write, and you could get paid during that period of time, I'd leave too, because it's hard as hell. Well, I'll, I mean, wait, 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 wait. Well, uh, let, me, let me just say a, a couple of quick things. Number one, this is beyond a gender issue. Yeah. It's a generational issue. Mm -hmm. And it's something that this industry has to address. It is something that we are going to be faced with a major, major talent crisis if we don't address it and address it soon. Because this new generation that's coming into the workforce, and, and I, I can't answer for the person who's 40, but I, what I can tell you is the new generation that's coming in, when you ask them what they do for a living, they don't just say, I'm an account executive at an advertising agency. They say, I'm an account executive who has a fashion blog, who's a DJ on the weekends, who's this, 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 this. I, they call themselves the slash generation. And if we as an industry don't culturally figure out how to work with that generation, we will lose them, we will lose every single one of them because they want a collection of experiences, they don't want to be working 80 hours a week doing one thing. That's not who they are, that's not how they define themselves. Go ahead. Hi. Cindy, you can come up here yeah, if you want. Cindy, Cindy come up here. you can yeah. come up here if you want. Come on. Yeah. <laughs> well, um, I, I, want to, I wanted to speak in response to that question, if that's okay, because yep. um, I was actually asked this um, at the end of my seminar at Cannes in June. Um, a, 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 a young person in the audience, uh, because I was talking about porn at Cannes, um, <laughs> I, was, I was buried on the agenda, you know, the first Sunday, uh, we were distinctly and notably missing from the promotional emails. And so um, the theatre was jam-packed, but it was predominantly with the young people in our industry who come to Cannes and go to every single session from the moment the festival opens on Sunday. And so a young woman in the audience, um, her question to me was, what would you say to a young person about to go into advertising um, in their first job? And uh, <laughs> I have to admit, I began laughing and I said, okay, I'm laughing because I can give you a very easy answer to that, and my answer is don't. <laughs> and, um, and I'm completely serious. So a lot of young people come to me and say to me, um, I want to go into advertising, and I go, why? And there's usually a deathly silence, and then, um, you know, one young guy's response was, that's a really good question, I don't know. And I explained to the audience in Cam what I meant when I, when I said don't. I meant, don't, don't go into advertising to work in advertising. And don't think about it as working in advertising. Go into advertising to make what you want to happen out of what you love about our industry. Mm -hmm. Because what we are talking about now is the enormous tragedy of our industry, which is that it is jam-packed full with brilliant people who spend and waste all of that brilliance and intelligence and articulacy, 
killing themselves 24-7 working on their client's business. And by the way, the, the enduring tragedy is that nobody has ever taken all of that intelligence, articulacy, brilliancy, and focused it on us and ourselves as an industry. Because if they had done, we would have reinvented the industry and the industry model, and we'd be in a very different place to the place we are now. And so what I said to that young woman in Cannes was, think about it as, what are the things that you would like to make happen? Whether they're for yourself, whether they're for the, the art of ad advertising, whether they're for things you'd like to see change in this world, and then go into advertising and make those things happen. And so to the young woman who asked that question today, um, I would say to your friends, what don't you like about what's happening right now? What don't you like about what you're not getting to create and make? Set out to do that. And actually, there are many ways that you can in our industry still. You could start your own, and I hesitate to use the word agency, but start your own venture. And by the way, you can totally um, keep your job and start planning what you want to do alongside it and then <laughs> jump, sh jump ship when the time is right. But when we talk about be the change you want to see, take that literally. Um, one of my bugbears is, uh, and I said this at Cannes as well, um, we do not listen enough to the youngest people coming into our industry. Everybody in every agency says, oh yeah, we welcome ideas from everywhere. No, they don't. When you are pitching 24-7, when you're under massive pressure, when you are really worried about the numbers, nobody wants to know what the baby account exec thinks. Mm -hmm. And actually they should, because I hear from those people, and I have to tell you that what the youngest people in our industry think is both screamingly funny and appallingly sad. But they have really interesting, really fresh perspectives. So, you know, your friends have those perspectives. They have a different way of looking at things. And they can take that and they can do their own thing or they can demand to do their own thing and they can look to make what they want to see happen in our industry happen a different way. They shouldn't give up on it and just leave. Mm -hmm. I mean, I do endorse what the panel says. At a certain point, you've lost your passion. You know, and if you've really decided, you know, forget this, I really want to go into something else, then you will. But if you retain any of the passion that you yourself are demonstrating, that's exactly what we're talking about today. We can reinvent this industry. We can reinvent the way we do business. We can reinvent the business model. Um, these are both things I talk about a lot um, in other presentations um, because they're things that are eminently possible to do and they're a lot easier to do than you think. And anybody who brings a fresh perspective to what we're doing can do that. The kind of perspective, hopefully, all of you are going to walk, at, uh, walk away today with. So don't give up on it. You know, when I say don't go into advertising, I just mean don't go into the advertising industry the way you think it is. Go into it and change it to be the industry you want to be. Okay. On that note, <laughs> I'll thank the panelists because we have nothing else to say. <laughs> thank, thank you, you guys. Thank you. Thank you.